In early October of the 2022 college football season, the Wisconsin Badgers made an unexpected move, pulling out of their top hat the news that they had fired head coach and also former quarterback for the school, Paul Christ, right after his 34-10 loss to the Illinois Fighting Illini. Christ at the time had a 2-3 and record and an 0-2 record in conference. Not only had he lost to Illinois at home 34-10, to who was coached by former Wisconsin head coach Brett Bielema, who's still with the Illini today, he also lost to Ohio State 52-21 to on the road. In a game which really was closer to 100-21, Ohio State, and Christ had also lost another home contest by a score of 17-14 to to Washington State in Week 2 of the season. It was a bad year for Wisconsin, make no mistake about it, and it was worse than many, including myself, had expected of the Badgers. But you can find on my own channel, I thought that Wisconsin was going to go 8-4 and four or 7-5 and five that year, and it was going to be likely a rebuilding year for Paul Christ and company. And I get the gist that even some other people thought the same about Wisconsin that season. But the Badgers wanted more. They didn't want to go 10-3, and 9-4, or if they go to the Big Ten Championship game, 11-3, 10-4, 12-2, and not win a conference title and not even compete for a national title. They wanted to win a conference title, and they wanted to compete for national championships. That's why Luke Fickle was hired. Luke Fickle brought Cincinnati to the college football playoff, he limited Bryce Young and Jamison Williams, him and Mike Tressel with their awesome defense, with a secondary that included now famous NFL defensive back Sauce Gardner. And in 2020, Cincinnati had an undefeated regular season, and they nearly beat Georgia in what I believe was the Peach Bowl, Georgia just achieving a last-second field goal to win that game. And then Fickle went 10-3 in 2022, was hired by the Badgers, and many, including myself, thought that with the Big Ten West's most talented roster, and with him being the Big Ten West's best head coach and having the West's best staff, that they would reach Indianapolis. Again, as under Paul Christ, the Badgers went to Indy three times in 2016, 2017, and 2019, and in the first year of the Big Ten West Division, Gary Anderson took the Badgers there. It was normal to expect Wisconsin to win the Big Ten West, and with the combination of Fickle, the talent they had, and the staff that he brought on, and the portal moves that he made, including bringing in Tanner Mordecai and other players, such as Will Pauling, I thought that they would go to Indianapolis. But that didn't happen. And I get the sense that some people are selling their stock on Wisconsin entering this season. And what I want to say is, that's a big mistake. Wisconsin had problems last year because it was year one under a head coach who's trying to restructure the identity of the program, who's trying to figure out what he wants to bring to Wisconsin from Cincinnati and from his other job experiences, like when he was a defensive coordinator at Ohio State and what he needs to make new. That's why he hired Phil Longo from North Carolina and not some basic or above-average or good offensive coordinator like the ones that he had throughout his tenure at Cincinnati. He wants to build Wisconsin into a Big Ten and national championship contender, and I think based off of the moves they've made in recruiting, in the transfer portal, the players that they have returning— and the staff that they have mostly kept together from last year, from last preseason, to this year and this preseason, I think the Badgers are going to rise this year, and there's a chance that they could break out and compete for the Big Ten Championship this season in year two of the Luke Fickle era. Welcome back, fellow football fanatics. I know that was a long introduction, but Wisconsin has been on a down stretch ever since a 2020 season where... I really think that they underperformed, and they underperformed yet again in 21 to their talent level. They underperformed again in 2022, and I do think that they, in a weird way, though not in the same way as previous Paul Christ teams, they underperformed in 2023. They shouldn't have lost to Iowa at home. In retrospect, they shouldn't have lost to a 5-7 a and seven Washington State team on the road. They probably should have beaten Indiana, should have beaten Northwestern. And 
that right there is four out of their five regular season losses. And they were competing with Ohio State. Wisconsin did not get blown out or dominated in any of their losses. But they also had several close wins. This was a team that pivoted at many points throughout the season, sometimes having a lot of success on the ground. Other times they surprisingly had success in the air. Sometimes their defense looked elite, and other times you questioned its effectiveness. It was year one. It is what it is. But that's why the introduction had to be long, is because the story of Wisconsin football is great, and in the past two seasons, there have been a lot of changes. If you want to hear me talk more about changes across the college football world, want me to produce more content about Wisconsin football, and you want to watch me talk about other Big Ten and college football schools, please hit that like button, please click that subscribe button, and also hit the notification bell so that you can get notified when I release more content. If you hit the notification bell, you should get notified every time I release a video or go live. Also, comment your thoughts on Wisconsin football, on the direction of the program, and what do you think Wisconsin's record will be this year? Will they reach the college football playoff? Will they play for the Big Ten championship game? Will they just simply improve compared to last year, or will they stay about the same? Or, this would be very bold and I think unrealistic, but it's always possible, Will they get worse? Let me know your thoughts down below. And if you want to go the extra mile and support the channel some more, please check out my Patreon page or my merchandise store via the links in the description or in the pinned comment at the top of the comment section. If you sign up as an All-American or Heisman member, you will get occasional weekly, bi-weekly bonus content. And if you're an all-conference, all-American, or Heisman member, your name will be featured at the beginning of the video and also featured at the end of the video along with a shout-out. If you're a Heisman member for six months, you get signed college football with Sam merchandise of your choice. Thank you all for supporting this channel, and thank you for watching this video and being a part of the best Big Ten football channel on YouTube. But let's get back into it and talk about the expectations for Wisconsin this season. Now, to a certain degree, we laid out the expectations in the introduction. That's the beauty of a long introduction, is you can tie in parts of what we're talking about here into the beginning of the video, and not just have a quick soundbite. But balance is needed, and the expectation for Wisconsin, I think, entering this season is to have more of a balance between the offense and the defense. This was a defense that wasn't elite, but they were top 25 in points allowed per game. They were coached by Mike Tressel, who's one of my favorite defensive coordinators. And the offense was one of Phil Longo's worst offenses of his entire career as an offensive coordinator. It was, it was bad. It was bleh. From the beginning of Ches Malusi getting more snaps than Braylon Allen, which just doesn't make any sense, an offensive line that was very up and down, a tight end room that was one of Wisconsin's worst in a long time, and Tanner Mordecai just not looking good at all. Some channels that I watched, I think one of them was Michigan Podcast with Steve Dace, was talking about how in Power 5 games while Mordecai was at SMU, he performed horribly. And I guess I should have listened to Steve Dace because I was high on Tanner Mordecai entering last year, and while against a bad defense in LSU, he looked great, and he was a tough, gritty player and a, a great man, good leader, he was not an effective passer. And him not being healthy also hurt this team throughout the middle to end of last year's season. The Badgers have not played for a Big Ten championship since 2019, and that has been in large part to offenses that are stiff, offenses that don't adapt, incompetent quarterback play. Running backs have never been Wisconsin's problem, even in the down years of the Paul Christ era, minus maybe 2020 with Jalen Berger, who was inconsistent. But that was a fluke year, if we're being honest. That was a weird year anyway, and Wisconsin's O-line that season was still was, was still a good offensive line. You still had that Wisconsin identity that sort of withered away in the 2022 season. So, Balance. That's a key word that I want to continue to bring on home. It's the reason why Luke Fickle brought in Phil Longo, something that's different 
an offensive coordinator who worked with Drake May, worked with Sam Howell when he was with Mac Brown at North Carolina. Great quarterbacks helped develop them and scheme them to put them in positions to win and score points, especially when North Carolina never had a good defense. And that's a difference here. Wisconsin has great defenses, and they'll continue to have great defenses as long as Fickle is there and as long as Mike Tressel is there, especially. Again, he's one of the best defensive coordinators in the country. Just look at his defense at Wisconsin this last season. More importantly, watch film from his 2018 defense at Michigan State when Brian Lewerke and Rocky Lombardi were just about as effective as Spencer Petrus was, and the O-line and wide receiver room were riddled with injuries. So balance is a necessity. And same with improvement on all sides of the ball. The Badgers returned 71% of their production from last season, and that's 20th in the country, and they're top 40 in both offensive and defensive returning production. They're 37th in offensive returning production, returning 70% of that, and they return 71% of their defensive production, which is 25th nationally. So you can expect reasonable improvements on both sides of the ball. If Wisconsin was first in defensive production coming back and outside of the top 100 in offensive returning production, with it only being year two, with Wisconsin still getting their ground in with high school recruiting and losing Braylon Allen, losing their quarterback, Tanner Mordecai, so losing key players, a stud player in Braylon Allen, it might be okay to say you got to, get, got to give the offense another year. It's just look for improvements on defense and look for at least Wisconsin to try and bring more balance and to have more of an identity. But no, they're top 20 in returning production, and in terms of preseason S&P Plus by Bill Connolly, they're 25th. So they're, in theory, a top 25 team in power rankings, and after spring ball, when we watch the spring games, have a better idea from spring practices, and maybe Wisconsin turns out to be a winner in the portal. They bring in much more than they lose in the April 15th to 30th cycle. Maybe they rise a bit in those rankings. They have a great staff, and they have players on their roster who are effective. They have Ricardo Hallman at defensive back. They have Will Pauling at wide receiver. Ches Malusi at running back is great when healthy. And overall, I think that after a 7-5 and five year last year, losing in the Citrus Bowl to an LSU team that's just much more talented and was the superior team for every week of the college football season last year, while not exactly a success, last year was what it was. This season, Wisconsin has a tougher schedule. We'll get into that a little later. I think that asking for an extra win or two maybe three. So in that 8, 9, 10 win range, I think is very reasonable. And if you want to say it should be higher than that, be my guest. After all, Wisconsin brought in a top 25 recruiting class, their top 25 in SP plus preseason and returning production, and they have a great staff. I mean, everything is, is screaming that this team is probably going to be top 25 or top 30 at the worst next season. And speaking of their schedule, here it is. I got the um, schedule that's printed out on the right side of the screen from an Instagram account that covers Wisconsin football. So whoever that is, thank you. But I think it's nifty because it shows the non-conference games first, but then it really highlights those regular season conference games. And a regular schedule, like one from FBSSchedules.com or from Wisconsin's website or even ESPN, would be too—it wouldn't fit on this screen in the format that I have. But this schedule, you look at it right here on the screen if you're, if you're watching on YouTube, it's tough. You have Alabama in Week 3. Thankfully, you have Western Michigan and South Dakota to warm up for that game against the Crimson Tide. It won't be Nick Saban's Crimson Tide. It'll be Kalen DeBoer's Crimson Tide. But a team that is much more talented than Wisconsin, a team that I think is a better head coach than Wisconsin. I think we can all agree that Kalen DeBoer is a 
a better head coach or at least a similar head coach to Luke Fickle, and a team that has the same or a better staff. All these things point in Alabama's direction, except for the fact that Wisconsin hosts the Crimson Tide. And it's the same thing with Wisconsin's other two teams in which they will certainly be favored to lose against. This is Penn State and Oregon. They will also probably be underdogs to USC and perhaps to Iowa on the road. Heck, maybe even Nebraska will be favored over them. I, I, doubt, I doubt that'll be the case for Rutgers, even though I think Rutgers will be very good this coming season. But case in point, they have a brutal schedule. Alabama, Penn State, Oregon, these are all teams that, I, in my opinion, will be top 10. I think USC and Iowa are top 25 teams. I think Rutgers, even top 25 team, I don't know if they'll be top 25 in power rankings for most people, or even for my own power ranking system that I'm working on, PPI, which I showed to many of you last season until the end of the season when I tried to re rework it and stuff got delayed. Right there, that's six teams that are in my preseason top 25, three of them top 10, and Nebraska is a team that is close to my top 25, and Minnesota and Northwestern will be tough teams as well. So this is a this is a hard schedule. Wisconsin, I could see the Badgers with this schedule going 10 and 2 straight up. If they maximize their talent, if the portal additions all work out, if the returning players improve, if there can be a breakout or star true freshman, you know the drill, all the things that have to go in. If most of the what ifs turn out to be good, they turn out to be positives. I could see Wisconsin going 10 and 2. And at that point, you're talking about them potentially playing in Indy. At the same time, I could also see this team lose to Alabama, Oregon, Penn State, and then lose at USC, at Iowa, and maybe another road game to Nebraska, Northwestern, or Rutgers. You pick and choose. And P.J. Fleck has shown an ability for his teams to compete with Wisconsin as well. I mean, this schedule is hard. It has its opportunities in the fact that the three toughest opponents will have to play in Camp Randall, Oregon, Penn State, and Alabama. Alabama, they have a new head coach. Parts of their roster are going to be new. And Wisconsin, that's an underrated environment for sure. And Oregon plays Wisconsin late in the season. They play Wisconsin on the road in November. So that could be an adjustment for Oregon. I doubt the Ducks or anyone outside of the Big Ten is used to playing in the snow. Well, some Big 12 teams, certainly, like Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa State. But outside of the Big Ten and parts of the Big 12 and maybe the northernmost parts of the ACC, I doubt that Pac-12 schools, former Pac-12 schools, are used to that, to playing in the snow often in November, especially Oregon being more on the coast, Oregon is typically more rainy and cold and muggy in the winter and not blizzard or negative wind chill, like let's say Wisconsin, Minnesota, parts of Michigan and, and, and the Dakotas and really the Midwest. It's different. We've talked about before in the college football world about how when teams from the north come to play down south, it can be quite the adjustment. And it will be the same when teams in the south have to come up north and play in some home playoff games. So the schedule is tough, but it does have its advantages for the Badgers. That's for sure. Their roster is talented enough, in my opinion, to compete in every game on their schedule. I don't know, and I don't think it's talented enough to go 12-0 and and win every game on their schedule, but compete? Absolutely. I think Wisconsin will share something with last year's team in the fact that they won't suffer any blowout losses. They won't. They will compete in every one of their games. Now, I don't expect this team to enjoy many blowout wins outside of Western Michigan and South Dakota, and maybe some some teams in the Big Ten will suffer the wrath of the Badgers, but we'll have to see. That's what fall is for. This schedule is one of the toughest in the country. It's one of the toughest in the Big Ten, but pair that with a roster that's top 25 in talent, a team that returns a lot of production like we mentioned a few minutes ago, 
this is workable. And thankfully, Wisconsin has to play Alabama, Oregon, and Penn State on their own home turf. If they had to play Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Oregon in Outson, and Penn State in Beaver Stadium, that would be a much more brutal slate of games. What are some improvements that this team can make? And it's kind of, it's kind of a weird transition point, but it is what it is. This team, last year, we talked about poor quarterback play, an offense that didn't even score four touchdowns per game on average, and a defense that was great but did have some question marks. Three areas that I think can improve and that will help Wisconsin perform better, even with their tougher schedule. These improvements will help Wisconsin, I think, win more total games this season than last season, despite having a tougher schedule compared to last season. Number one, you have Tyler Van Dyke. He should be Wisconsin's best quarterback since Russell Wilson. And since Russell Wilson, you've had Joel Stave, you have had Alex Hornibrook, you've had Brian Houston, you've had Graham Mertz, and you have had Tanner Mordecai. Also, don't forget about Jack Cohn in 2019. Um, but I think Tyler Van Dyke at his ceiling and with the coaching now at Wisconsin could be better and actually should be better than Jack Cohn was in 2019. And Jack Cohn was a good quarterback. That was a He was a huge part of the reason why Wisconsin's fall under Paul Christ didn't officially start in 2018 and most interpreted it as starting in 2020 or even as late as 2021. He was a gap. He was a band-aid on the bullet wound that was Paul Christ's program falling apart. Because in 2019, you you saw parts of the Wisconsin identity, in retrospect with hindsight, falling apart a little bit. The 19 defense was not as good as the 16 or 17 defense. And there was just something about that team, whether it was their loss to Illinois that year, where it, something just felt off, where they, they didn't have that Wisconsin toughness. I mean, that Illinois team was not good. They were 6-7. and seven. Cohn was great. He was for the Badgers. He had a little bit of mobility to him, and he was their best passer in the Paul Christ era. Van Dyke, in 2021, he was great. I forget the name of the starter. I forget the name of the starter who began that year, who played in the COVID year during 2020. Um, I think I think his name was King from Miami, Florida. Their quarterback there. He took over for him, Derek King. Yes, and he was listed as a dark horse Heisman candidate for the 2021 season. Van Dyke took over for him in Manny Diaz's last season and he put up very impressive numbers. But in 2022 he fell back. Early in 2023 it it looked like he was back to his old self playing impressive football, but he began to fall apart during the end of the season. After starting out the year, this is entering the Georgia Tech game, the famous game where Mario Cristobal didn't take a knee. Entering that game, Tyler Van Dyke had 11 passing touchdowns, one interception. He didn't have a game where he completed less than 70% of his passes. And outside of a game against Miami of Ohio that started out slow, he didn't have a game where he had under a 91 QBR. And then everything fell apart. And at the end of the season, he finished with 19 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, only 16 rushing yards, only completing 65.8% of his passes, and only passing for 2,703 yards. And he only got sacked 10 times. Miami had a, a good offensive line last year, a very physical offensive line, physical trench play on both sides of the football as well. Van Dyke needed a new start, and Cameron Ward should actually be an improvement for Miami, Florida, in the same way that Van Dyke should be an improvement even more so for the Badgers. So his transfer was a win-win. I think that he will contribute here and be one of the better quarterbacks in the Big Ten this season. The wide receiver position is another area of improvement because all starters return, most notably Will Pauling. Will Pauling was the most reliable receiver that Wisconsin had last year, and he was one of the more reliable receivers in the Big Ten, in fact. He had 837 receiving yards, six receiving touchdowns, 
and 74 receptions. After having limited playing time at Cincinnati in 2022, he transferred into Wisconsin and found himself being their best receiver. And against LSU, he had two receiving touchdowns, 143 receiving yards, and averaged almost 18 yards per reception. He also had receiving touchdowns against Ohio State, Illinois, Indiana, and Minnesota. He is an impact player, and he got more important as the year went on last year. I expect him 5'10", 187, and that was as of last year. He's probably gained some weight. Maybe maybe he's even grown an inch. Who knows? Sometimes you don't start stop growing until your mid-late 20s. He should be even better this coming season. Tyrell Henry transferred in from Michigan State, and some other Wisconsin receivers that return are C.J. Williams, Vinny Anthony II, and Bryson Green. You also have Quincy, Mc, Quincy Burroughs and Trench Kekahuna and Tommy McIntosh. So this room is deep. It's, in my opinion, one of the deeper receiver rooms in the Big Ten. They should improve and take a step forward. And at linebacker, despite Njong Meta and Goats leaving, the Badgers add four transfers to the position, and Jeff Petrowski returns, and also Daryl Peterson returns at outside linebacker. So I think there's a chance that the linebacker room can improve. Tackett Curtis transfers in from USC. He's talented, and with proper coaching and schematics, he'll be a beast. Sebastian Cheeks, Jaheim Thomas, and Leon Lowry transfer in as well. Now, all of this, I think, snowballs into what should be a giant leap forward for Wisconsin this year. What does this mean record-wise? I have an idea, but you're going to have to watch my Big Ten predictions video. In order, in order to figure that out. I have a good idea, and it may even change after the transfer portal window. I think this upcoming portal window will be insane, and there are some predictions that I made at the beginning of this preseason that I've stuck to that I'm thinking about changing after the portal window ends because I'm, as I'm doing more research and thinking things through and discovering new things. There are, there are changes and adaptations that have to be made. But I think Wisconsin will fall in that 8, 9, 10 regular season win total. I think they do. Maybe you should add 7 on there and take off 10 just to be safe. But more likely, this team will improve than not their record from last year. They have one of the better staffs in all of college football, and I think Fickle is a top 10 head coach currently. With Tyler Van Dyke, Will Pauling, and a, an offensive line that returns Joe Huber, Ray, Jake Renfro, Jack Nelson, Riley Malman. They should be great there in pass block, run block. The offensive line, they lost Nolan Rucci to the portal and another offensive lineman transferred, so there may be some depth concerns, but they recruited well in the 2024 recruiting class overall and on the offensive line better than they had in the previous two classes. And I, 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 th I think it's inevitable that the offense will improve. How? Outside of the simplicity of they upgraded at quarterback, they returned all their receivers, and they returned most of their tight ends, and Riley no Nowakowski and Tucker Ashcraft. Also, they have incoming transfer Jackson McGowan, and only Hayden Rushi leaves. He's projected to be a priority free agent or a round 7th pick, according to rlads.com. I think that the offense overall will improve. And the ground game, losing Braylon Allen absolutely hurts. But Chesma Lucy, if healthy, should be good. Tawi Walker, he was a tough runner, a, look, power back. Total power back, tough guy. Um, you're you're not going to stop him in his tracks. His momentum's going to carry him forward for another yard or two. That's a nice running back duo there. And Jackson Acker having another year of strength and conditioning and good coaching will reap benefits as well. So I think the running back room is deeper than people probably think at this point. I think a lot of people see, oh, Braylon Allen's leaving. And they think, oh my gosh, will the, will the run game survive next year? 
I think it will. Probably won't have the same upside, but it'll still be a great rushing attack. And all of that combines for an offense that improves. And the defense, they return most of their production. The secondary is an area that I have some questions with, just because Alex Grinch is their coach. But if you only look at the players, there's nothing to question there. Hunter Wohler will be one of the best safeties in not just the Big Ten, but the country. Ricardo Hallman has that same potential at cornerback. Um, Nizier for Quirin, he should be a good corner. And I think that the loss of Travian Blaylock and Jason Matry won't be... They, they won't be huge losses. Also, Kamoy Latu makes a return, and Preston Zachman. So I think that the safety room in particular, but also cornerback, you have great depth. You have your playmakers. Hallman had multiple interceptions last year. I mean, he, know, he knows how to make a catch with the ball. You'd think at times that he's a receiver. And there are also questions, I think, about the defensive line. With um, You only have three down linemen. In this defense, this 3-3-5-2-4-5 defense. And I don't think that there are a lot of playmakers on the defensive line for Wisconsin. But they're strong at linebacker. Trestle will be able to scheme offensive coordinators, opposing offensive coordinators, into insanity. And when you have the incoming transfers they do, the returning production that they have at the D-line, secondary, and parts of linebacker, and all over the offense. This team is on the right track, and they will certainly improve compared to last year. I think that that's obvious in terms of at least power rankings and competing with good teams and making sure they beat the teams that they should beat. No more losses to Northwestern or especially to Indiana. I mean, that was absolutely terrible. I mean, you just had to keep Tom Allen in Bloomington, thinking that he had job security for another week or two. If, if he lost that game, he may have been fired earlier. But alas, Indiana broke their losing streak in Big Ten Conference play with a win over Wisconsin. And they hadn't... I forget when was the last time they beat Wisconsin, but we... We won't get into that. There will be no more losses to teams like that in the case of Indiana, and most likely a team like last year's Northwestern. But Northwestern returns a lot. They're top 10 in returning production, and they have some good defensive players. So we'll see. This schedule's tough, so Wisconsin could be 6-6 six and six in the regular season or 7-5, and five, and overall they would be a better football team. That's how much tougher their schedule is. That's all I wanted to say in this video. Thank you for watching my breakdown and some of my analysis and opinions for Wisconsin football for the 2024 college football season. Thank you again for watching the video. Please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and click the notification bell so that you can get notified when I release more college football content. Thanks to Crash2488 for sponsoring this video and channel as a Heisman member. Thanks to Spencer Bringhurst, Chris Lane, and SFS Inverter for sponsoring this channel and video as a All-American member, and thanks to Will Loftus, John Lynn, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Austin Christmas, and Janisha Cockrell for sponsoring this video and channel as an All-Conference member. Have a great day, guys, and I will see you all around. Bye-bye.